Hi, welcome back to Vietnam Real Estate Insights, the program that looks at market trends with industry experts here in Vietnam. I'm your host, Harlow Russell, and today we have Stephen Wyatt, the country head of Jones Lang LaSalle, Vietnam, and he'll be discussing the opportunities and the challenges of investing your money in Vietnam. Stephen, thank you for your time to be here today. Thank you very much, Harlow. Great. Let me tell our viewers a little bit about you. Thank you. So, Stephen uh, has had a very long career in real estate. In fact, he's one of the very few people that I've interviewed that actually has a Bachelor's of Science in real estate from Edinburgh University. And he began his career in the real estate industry in 1996 in the UK. He's had experience in Europe, Asia, and Africa in Botswana. And uh, I'll let you tell the viewers a little bit about that. Um, he worked for Knight Frank uh, starting in 2002 in London and Botswana uh, and came to Vietnam as the head of Knight Frank here in 2010. Uh, Stephen joined J Jones Lang LaSalle in Vietnam in 2013. And he's primarily been involved in large retail transactions in the UK and is currently advising one of the largest property funds in Vietnam on a very large $280 million divestment strategy. In addition, Stephen advises Vietnam clients on disposing of portfolios as well as funding for new land projects, typically valued at between 50 to $100 million apiece. Uh, Stephen's a member of the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors and chairman of the RICS Advisory Group in Vietnam. Again, welcome to the program. Thank you. So, uh, first off, can you give our viewers an idea of what Jones Lang LaSalle does in Vietnam? Sure. JLL, as we're now known, as our global uh, identity is uh, commonly known as, is uh, we've, we've been in Vietnam uh, for nine years, so it'll be our, our 10th anniversary next year. Yeah. So Congratulations. Very big year for us. We've uh, invested heavily in the business, and we now have approximately 200 people. Okay, um, very good. Both uh, covering the country, but primarily in Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh. Okay. The main sectors that we deal in is on the capital market side. So we do a lot of uh, large transactions with uh, both foreign and domestic investors. We have a large, what we call markets team, which is leasing on office, retail, and industrial. Mm -hmm. Project management, we have a large project management team, primarily dealing with office fit-out work valuations, market research, and advisory work is, is a large component of the business. Mm. And then we have what we call IFM, which is Integrated Facilities Management. And what is that? That is a, a, a more sophisticated version of property management. Okay. So some of our clients um, include the likes of HSBC, ANZ, Procter & Gamble, so a, a large number of our global corporate clients um, we would carry out IFM work for. for so a much more detailed uh, uh, sort of property management service and generally aimed at occupiers. I see, okay. So again that's a fairly large part of the, mm. the, the business and um, in addition to that we have a property management, property and asset management um, uh, department as well. Very good. Well, for JLL Vietnam, what were some of the highlights in, in this year so far of, of significant uh, uh, activity uh, or, e or events that have happened uh, uh, from your perspective in Vietnam that, that you've been involved in? Well, I think 2015 we've seen a real uh, turning point in mm. terms of the real estate market in Vietnam. How so? Which is on a positive, positive uh, way, a very much positive way. So the last four or five years in Vietnam, pretty tough market conditions. Mm, mm. Economy's really uh, been pretty soft, and, and that's sort of uh, translated into uh, you know fairly soft market condition, real estate market conditions. Mm -hmm. 2015, we've seen a renewed confidence in the market, which mm. is uh, 
really increased a lot of development activity and um, overall general market conditions are a lot more positive than what we've seen in the last five years. Mm. So to give you an example, on the, on the capital market side, on the investment transaction side, we've carried out in excess of $200 million worth of transactions in Vietnam. That's you know, significantly above previously, previous years. On the leasing side, we've carried out significant transactions like the uh, 4,000 square meter um, office leasing transaction to Johnson & Johnson. Mm. So we're seeing a lot of the larger multinational companies now upscaling and, and looking for additional uh, uh, space in, in, in both of the major cities, which, um, which is good news for, for the property market and landlords in particular. Absolutely. Do you see, uh, from your perspective, much difference between Ho Chi Minh and Hanoi in terms of office leasing? Office leasing side, yes, there's, uh, it's a really a tale of two cities, Ho, Ho Chi Minh very much um, undersupplied on the, certainly from a grade A office market point of view, and we're, we will start to see an increase in, in uh, grade A uh, office rentals in 2016, which we haven't witnessed for, for the last four or five years. Mm. Uh, compare that to Hanoi, where we see still see a, a, a large, um, large amount of supply in the market. Oversupply. Oversupply in the market. So Hanoi is is definitely lagging behind Ho Chi Minh from from that point of view. So um, yeah, we we, we see uh, the the office market in Ho, Ho Chi Minh f being fairly buoyant over the next uh, two to three years. Oh, very good. Well, let's talk about 2016 and in terms of you know, foreign investment flows in real estate through, through mergers and acquisitions in M&A. So um, tell us your view of 2016. Uh, where, where do you think this piece of the market and your particular business is, is going to go? Well, I think what we've seen through 2015 and we expect to see throughout 2016 is uh, Vietnam is, is very much back on the radar. For a for a large number of foreign investors, that's really because we've we've witnessed, like I said before, that you know the four or five years of very soft market conditions. Yes. yes. The economy now is is gaining momentum. We've got GDP growth at six and a half percent this mm -hmm. year. Yes. Inflation's come back under control, down to two three percent, and uh, we have a much more positive sentiment in the market. So Vietnam has very much come back on the radar from a foreign investor point of view when compared to other Southeast Asian countries. Mm. So the likes of Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore to a certain extent, Indonesia, Philippines are, have, have certain issues in, in their own markets and Vietnam is, is, is coming out you know, at you know, quite a high level when compared to other countries. How about the currency? I mean, uh, global investors who you know, don't know much about Vietnam might might initially perceive well. It's these there's there's always currency risks and currency issues here. But from your perspective, you know, compared to other countries in Southeast Asia, what what what's your view of that? Should a uh, in, in terms of M and A is is currency um, uh, fluctuations a risk here? I think it needs to be taken into consideration, as with all. F investments in emerging markets uh, we, we've seen what we've seen over the past year is is maybe a sort of a five percent devaluation mm -hmm. of, of the, the Vietnamese dong compare that to other countries in the region that's pretty attractive so or, or manageable well it's certainly manageable yes so there's certainly needs to be taken into consideration but at the moment it, it seems to be under control, okay. and um, you know I think the, the the government and the State Bank of Vietnam are, are keeping a pretty close close watch on it. Very good. Well, in your opinion, which projects will attract M and A uh, in, in in the near term? So what we're seeing at the moment, a lot of there's a lot of investor interest in Vietnam, a lot of foreign investor interest. They're really looking at pretty much all sectors of, of the real estate market. I would say residential still 
attracting the, the, the majority of the interest. Uh, majority of investors coming into the market, their number one option would be a grade A office in Ho Chi Minh. If, if they could choose any, any, any sector, that would mm -hmm. be the number one. Okay. The, the issue is very limited supply, lim limited opportunities to acquire investment grade um, uh, office in, in, right. in Ho, Ho Chi Minh. What would be number two if you, you know, in the ideal picture, grade A of, uh, office space Ho Chi Minh, uh, in that same uh, thought, what's, what's number two in Vietnam, would you say? Well, I would say, so office first, then residential, probably those, those, well, those would be one or two. I think we're going to see a lot more activity in the industrial space mm. because of you know, th there's been a lot of publicity about the trade agreements that have yes, been signed TPP, off. TPP, for example. So TPP will eventually get signed off. You know, I think it's going to take a little bit of time to go through the system and the, the various legal Bureaucracy framework, is, yes. etc. But I think that will happen. Big EU trade agreements just been signed off. Korean tr agreement trade agreement just been signed. The ASEAN uh, agreement will be coming into effect as of 1st of January this 2016. All this is very, very positive for, for the industrial, logistics, and uh, you know, w warehouse space. Yes. And that sector, we're getting a lot of inquiries, both from manufacturers looking to yes. come into Vietnam and also from the investor side. Mm -hmm. Do you see, uh, I've heard that uh, Vietnam seems to be progressing in the concept of uh, factories that may have been established elsewhere, particularly China. Uh, those companies looking to relocate their factories to Vietnam. But what's your perspective on that? Have you seen much in terms of relocation uh, of, of uh, factories in, in Asia to Vietnam or not? What we're currently seeing at the moment I, I wouldn't say it's relocating out of China. Okay. I think the 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 inquiries that we are getting is, is they're not necessarily continuing their expansion program in China and are now looking at Vietnam as a, as an alternative. Mm. So I think that's again it's a positive for Vietnam. We're also seeing uh, a number of inquiries be on the back of the TPP agreement coming from the U.S. So some of the mm -hmm. big manufacturers from the U.S increasing their presence in, in, in Vietnam. We're also starting to see Vietnam being mentioned as a Southeast Asian regional hub, mm, which that's interesting. we haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. So these trade agreements, whilst they're going to take some time to, to, to come to fruition, yes. uh, we, in the next five to ten years, we're really going to see, I think, that, that benefit for, for Vietnam mm. and the real estate market. Very good. Um, Tell me, what, what would be the difficulties that foreign investors face when they implement M&A in, in the real estate market of Vietnam? I think, great question, and I think it's, uh, it's the, the first question that every, every investor you know, wants to un try and understand the market in Vietnam. I think the first, the, the first response that I would always give is that, you know, Vietnam, you need to put it into context. It's a very much a frontier market. It's a what do you mean by frontier? Frontier as in the legislation, the infrastructure, the, the, the property market as a whole is still very much in its infancy. So very, very early days from a, from a real estate market point of view. So there there, there is an inherent risk in terms of investing in Vietnam. That, that's, that's number one. I think, but investors that have capital that they want to deploy and, and have, uh, can, can allocate a percentage to an, a frontier emerging market, obviously Vietnam looks attractive and, and it is an attractive destination for foreign investment. The, the issues that most foreign investors will face, the obvious one is obviously the language barrier. I mean, yes. try, trying <laughs> just getting into and, and understanding the market and in a foreign language is, is, is never easy. And, and Vietnamese is particularly challenging. It's not the easiest language <laughs> to get, get hold of. Yes. Uh, it, 
then, like I say, th 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 there's two or three distinct issues that we generally find. One is legal ownership of, of the actual property or the yes. land. Yes. Can be challenging and what would appear to be something fairly straightforward can also can also be uh, a, a bit of a minefield. Mm. So the legal ownership, I mean, a lot of foreign investors uh, do team up with local joint venture partners. Yes. Um, so obviously picking the right joint venture partner with good track record, corporate governance, all of those things, again, challenging, but you know, it can be, uh, it can be navigated, you know, if you, if you go through the right channels. Um, and then just, just really trying to understand the market. So we would always recommend you know, und undertaking detailed market research, mm -hmm. really trying yes. to understand the market before, yes. you know, diving into a project. Because there are intricacies in, in the market that are just, uh, only seen in Vietnam. Mm. What, can you give an example of a unique type characteristic uh, uh, here? Well, I think what we, what we do see, you know, it, because of the the nature of the Vietnamese real estate market, I think there's you see a lot of headline figures, and but there's also a number of layers that come underneath it. So, just looking at the headline figures in terms of the economy or even the real estate market yes. is, is not necessarily enough. So you need to get a, a deep dive into actually what's going on in the market. I think there's, we find uh, Vietnam very emotional in terms of making a decision making process. So what do you mean by that? From a domestic developer or, or even from just a, uh, from, from the Vietnamese buying a house, yes. if it's, uh, it's a very much a, a um, like I say, uh, it's an emotional sort of decision-making process. So not necessarily based on financial uh, a feasibility study or a, a due, you know going through a due diligence process. Or Hard data. You mean. So, it's, so, so it's so it's it's more yes, I like it. Yes, I'm going to objective. Yeah, ah, absolutely. Interesting. So, which is great for doing deals because you know it's it's a very quick and and, and you know fairly straightforward if, if Vietnamese like a development or want to do something, the transaction is done very quickly. But there's also mistakes made along the yes. way going through that process. Oh, so that's a very interesting tip, very interesting tip. Uh, let me ask you, which countries are most actively investing in Vietnam from your perspective? So we've seen, I think historically we've always seen the Asian, uh, a number of the more mature markets in Asia um, investing in Vietnam. So the likes of Japan, Korea, Singapore have always been one, two, or three. Or okay. you know, Hong Kong, to a certain extent, through China. Uh, so those those are, are still very much there. Japanese definitely back in the market in 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 some force at the moment, and mm -hmm. they've they've really renewed their their activity in in the real estate market. We are starting to see, just in, in Asia, some of the big conglomerates from the Philippines, mm. from Indonesia, and from Malaysia now as well, uh, and, and also from, from, from Thailand. So th a lot of the, the conglomerates from, from the other Asian countries are now saying that we, we, we've, we've had a good run in our own country mm -hmm. and we think let's, you know, let's give Vietnam a go. So, a lot of interest from the Asian countries, but we're also witnessing quite strong interest from some of the big private equity oh. uh, firms from the US. From the US, so private equity institutional investors. Yep, and so the likes of Warburg Pincus is a good example that have uh, invested heavily into one of, into Vingroup, the big mm. uh, uh, conglomerate in, in, in Vietnam. So they've put 300 million into the retail platform in, in Vingroup. Oh and some of the other, you know, uh, fairly well-known private equity houses from from the U.S. In addition to that, sovereign wealth funds from from the Middle East, w and we're now getting investors from India. So, a, a, a real mixed bag from pretty much all over the globe now. So, what you see is really Vietnam is on the radar screen. 
Very much so, yeah. So in, in terms of this investment that's coming in, either from individual companies, sovereign wealth funds, institutional investors, what's your comments on the kind of returns that can be expected uh, in Vietnam? I think from a, from a pure investment point of view, so for, for if you're looking at an income producing asset, a, a typical office mm -hmm. uh, income producing um, investment opportunity, anything between nine to 11% is, is fairly typical in, really? in, the, in the major cities. That, that, that seems very attractive. Very attractive. I mean, obviously with that, you have country risk that, that's yes. attributed to it. So that's, that's factored into that sort of that yield profile. Wow. And, and you said, sorry, uh, would you expect the same between the, well, three major cities, Ho Chi Minh, Hanoi, and Da Nang? Or are mm. there significant differences in, in these kind of returns, generically speaking, between the cities? I think that the two major cities, so Ho Chi Minh, Hanoi, in line with each other. Ho Chi Minh's always going to fetch a little bit of a premium, still considered very much the commercial center. Yes. Uh, so I would rank them as Ho Chi Minh first, Hanoi second, and then Da Nang would, would come in third. I see. Okay. Okay. Let's go back to uh, some of the risks, uh, because people who are not familiar with Vietnam, of course, may have certain interpretations. Let's talk about the key risks that investors really need to be cognizant of. And then uh, I'd like to know how does Jonas Lang LaSalle you know, specifically help to mitigate some of these uh, country risks here? Mm. So w for, from a JLL point of view, what we would always do when we, when we take on an, an instruction, we carry out our own initial due diligence process before we take on any instruction. So we're doing we're, we're ensuring that anything that we're bringing to the market has, has already come, gone through our due diligence process. Otherwise, we're, we're bringing opportunities to the market that you know, if, if, there, if there are issues with legal ownership or there's issues with the title or planning use or, or whatever it may be, then we obviously can't sell it anyway. So we try and do a lot of upfront due diligence ourselves within our own uh, in-house teams, that cuts out a lot of the, the, you know, I suppose delays and potential risks for any any investor. We would always, like I say, we we, we would we would certainly encourage carrying out, um, you know, detailed market research, feasibility studies, um, you know, for for any investor, which I'm sure any foreign investor is going to do. You know, the, the due diligence pro process is is fairly. Uh, you know, it would be much longer for a foreign investor, like you know, compared to you know a Vietnamese um, group. It's so I, I I think that would be the, the the main things that we would try. You know, we we really try and make the process as as we try and simplify the process as much as possible to to iron out any of those. Um,